welcome to Ghosts and Grit. Hey, what's going on? I'm joined by Neil Strauss on this episode. He's an old friend of mine. He's a journalist. He's an author. Uh, he is an investigator. Phenomenal guy. Really interesting interview. We do a deep dive into some of the projects he's worked on, some of his current podcasts, uh, as well as the paranormal. So uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy. Oh, and tidbit, Neil Strauss is a bit of a survival expert, so kind of cool. Anyhow, let's dive into this. Let's dive in. Let's go. All right. Welcome to Ghosts and Grit. I'm joined by a, a longtime friend of mine, Neil Strauss. How are you, Neil? It's so amazing to see you. Again. It is. It's so it fun. is. I was I was thinking about it. Like we, there was a window where you and I we we hung out a bunch. We had a bunch. I think yeah. we had like wild adventures that yeah. probably couldn't even be mentioned here. Yeah. For, exactly. Yeah. Definitely. You know. But that we also had some really good like wholesome adventures. Like yes. doing that search and rescue course. Yeah. And then the medical thing at your house where we had like. The uh, we were doing like the life almost like live tissue training. Yeah, you know he uh, and what Jack's talking about is this uh, this urban search and rescue guy who brought us who taught us basically how to do any kind of home medicine operation. Yeah. Gave us all kinds of like equipment we shouldn't be having. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he passed away like within t like two weeks ago. Kevin Reeve. Yes, Kevin. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I um, I uh. Because I ended up taking his Urban Escape and Evade course right. some years ago, and then he did the show with my dad and I. He, we went to his, we went out to George, uh, St. George in Utah. Oh no way! Yeah, yeah, and uh, it because I and did you? What was it did, from the weird like staff infection? Is that what ended up killing him? Remember, he had that. This is a cautionary story for those listening, which is I think he just had a small cut on his foot. Yeah, it was on a motel room carpet. Uh, woke up and it was so infected and blew up and he had the staph infection and would have died within a couple hours if he didn't get to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know the reasons why. I know he drank a... Uh, please don't sue us, Monster, but I know he drank a lot of Monster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I just think... Uh, but um, it's interesting. I always had this discussion with him, and again, I really don't know what it's from, so I don't want to make any guesses, but about how survival, was, survival and surviving the apocalypse was so important. Mm. But then he ate so horribly yeah you know um but i but i love him and he taught so many people so many great things oh and had such God. a good heart that guy was such a wealth of knowledge yeah. man and he was a boy he came up and like was like an eagle scout yeah. it was the coolest just for context it was the coolest class and we bought it on this stuff which is you tell you how to escape from handcuffs yep how to like run with a ball and chain mm -hmm. uh what else how to pick locks yeah which i think was really useful when you're uh, locked out of something and you have your I've, own. I've used it so many times. Yeah. Like had to like, oh, I can't get into my house and like the kits that he showed us how to like showed how to make and man, it was in like you couldn't put a price on that knowledge. My, my favorite and it's such so simple is to get to get over a barbed wire fence. You take the mat in your your car mat. Yeah. You throw it over the barbed wire and just climb right over. Yeah. Don't try this at home. Yeah, please don't try this at home. And well, if you're gonna do it, just don't get caught. <laughs> right, right, and, and take responsibility for whatever happens. Yeah, right, <laughs> <laughs> not Jack and Neil's fault. How did you? What inspired you? Because what you wrote Emergency, what thirteen, fourteen years ago? Yeah. What back then was your like catalyst for like, hey, you know what? I need to get into survival. It's wild how everyone's into survival now. From what we've been through as a country in the last eight or ten years yeah so so back then it was like we were born in this golden era where you know world war one world war two the great depression those are things for grandparents or great grandparents and then literally the cold war was ending and so there was like just no threat at all yeah. like other than oh gas prices are high or <laughs> you know or the or the tech bubble burst like we lived with these kind of golden this generation that had this golden spoon in our mouths and then all of a sudden you know you can trace it to to 9-11 like at that moment all of a sudden it was oh shit we have enemies mm -hmm. they're here and they're killing people um so that was the first moment when and then all the decisions we made afterward that led to a lot of disastrous things now so i think that was the first moment when like oh there can be an attack on our soil um, and then B, when Hurricane Katrina happened, mm. and I know it's to to imagine to see on the news a disaster that the government knew was coming, and bodies floating in the streets of a U.S. city, and you realize how defenseless we are as individuals. Mm -hmm. Like the entire system and every system is based on our trust in it. That's the only currency it has. And when you stop trusting it, and we're seeing what happens to all our institutions now, because everybody, nobody trusts 
the system or the institutions anymore, whether it's the health or the police or what have you. So I realized I had to take safety into my own hands and be responsible for myself. Yeah. And someone raised in our generation who had no real skills or talents, I started from scratch. And so talking to Kevin Reeve, Tom Brown at the tracker school, uh, all these extreme survivalists, I just sort of asked them to teach me everything to the degree so I could survive in the woods with nothing but a knife yeah. and the clothes on my back. What, what got you into it, by the way? Um, you know, it was kind of, you know what, you probably, it was probably Katrina. Wow. It was like the same, same thing. Like I remember I was, I was on a, I'd climbed El Cap the week of Katrina. So like when I, you know, it was a seven day climb. And so when I started the climb, everything was fine. And when I came back down, I, I walked into like a, a liquor store or whatever just to grab a drink. And it was like, oh, uh, New Orleans is gone. It's like a wasteland and people are just murdering each other in the streets. And I was like, holy shit. Like that, it's one thing, you know, and this was only four years after 9-11. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute. We're getting attacked by terrorists. They just wiped out, half, you know, downtown New York. And now cities are being swallowed up by storms. I'm like, I should probably know what, like you, like what the fuck to do here. Um, and it just kind of really planted a seed. You know, a few years later, I started getting into shooting and, um, you know, firearm stuff. And it just, it's been like a, con it's, it's funny. Like I, you know, the prepping kind of fad, you know, has kind of come in waves over the last, you know, 20 years. But it's something that like me and my core group of friends have always kind of just it's it's almost like a part of lifestyle for us in a weird way. Yeah. yeah I mean, and it's so cool. It's it's really actually fun to know how to forage. Yeah. And find find your own food and, yeah. and realize there are all these edible things just growing by the side of the road that are actually great. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and then I know you're probably getting to this as a question, but COVID mm. then <clears throat> with this preparation <laughs> we had as it was happening, I remember I emailed my mailing list and said, here's what you should stock up before the lockdown and everything. Yeah. Because it was clear that this was going to happen. Fully. I remember in January I was I was in I was in Hawaii on vacation and I'm seeing they're like, "Oh, Chinese, you know, China's locking down its cities, you know, canceling travel." And I'm like, "Oh, wait, this is coming here." And I remember we were in production on a on a shoot and I was like, "Hey, get in contact with the insurance company and find out like what what's their plan?" Because we're midway through production, we're going to get shut down, and we're going to have to eat. Like, what's happened? And we and we called, and our production manager in EIC was talking with the insurance company, and they were like, "Yeah, you know, I mean, this has never happened before, so we don't really have." And I'm like, "Yeah, it did. 1919, 100 years ago. Like, you're telling me that you guys not like pandemic, like flus, nothing like that has ever crossed your mind?" And they were like, mm, "No." And I just was like, okay. So I was like ordering masks for everyone. I was like, nope, this this fucking thing's coming. And it was, yeah. and I bet you had the same thing. How many people called you, being like, what do I do? Oh, everybody. And you were right. And what do I do? Yeah. yeah. It's so funny <laughs> when we have this human, with this just human instinct, just to think that everything's going to be the same as it was yesterday. Yeah. And and the most fascinating thing, though, just the to the the interdependency of everything so like the hysteria around toilet paper like yeah i really think it's a big lesson that goes beyond toilet paper <laughs> that is a it you know people the toilet paper run on toilet paper was the same as the bank crashes mm -hmm. in the sense of people can be manipulated into hysteria and then do something that doesn't help their best interests or make sense at or all. make sense <laughs> and going back to the idea that the system is based on people who believe in it once something's doubted, yeah. it all starts to fall apart. So, and then the idea that we're out of toilet paper and we really have to have a shortage for three or four months till we can get that toilet paper engine going. I mean, what if that was food? Yeah, or or clean water, or something, and you realize how interdependent everything is, and that one crack in the system and it all falls apart. Yeah, going back to Kevin used to say like we're just, you know, I want to say uh, seven missed meals away from total chaos. Yeah. I forget what his number was. Yeah, it was it was nine. You're nine, nine. You're nine meals away from total chaos. Yeah. And then his breakdown of like rise of the warlord and like his whole, you know, what happens and it's. I mean, we you, we saw it in different glimpses over COVID. I mean, I remember I was texting with him constantly over COVID, being like, "What do you think is going to happen next?" And he, you know, he was he was pretty pretty spot on with it. Here's an interesting thing, and this isn't true of Kevin, but a lot of survivalists that I met in this time. <clears throat> and I'm not just saying this because Kevin passed it. He's just a really good guy. But a lot of these people are 
subscribe to the old code of what a male is. Mm -hmm. They're strong alpha males. They can beat up anyone in a you know in a, in a, in a fight. Yeah. Uh, but they're disempowered in the society where these n nerds with glasses like myself, <laughs> you know, have are all these kind of sort of people they could beat up easily are running the culture and the society. Yeah. And they secretly want the apocalypse to happen so they can realign the social order with themselves at the top. Yeah. No, it's that's a, it's such a yes, exactly. Like yeah. perfectly put because it is it is a I think there is a level of like there's a level of fantasy with it to a degree because it's like all right, you know, am I going to like you said or am I going to rise to the top? Right. You and if, and if you're the strongest person with the greatest survival skills and that can fight off an army, yeah. well you're on Elon Musk's uh, security team. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> you're not Elon Musk. No. Yeah. Yeah, it's you know it's really interesting. So when I did when I did um Kevin's um urban escape and evade course much like it was years after we we did the the thing together um we uh i was in santa monica and we were doing a couple nights sleeping out rough and all that and and we realized like oh there was a sneaker shop and there was a bunch of people sleeping because uh some new sneaker was dropping and so they're all sleeping out in the street and we're like wait this is great like these are all none of these people are homeless but it's safety in numbers like there's a kind of, we can kind of just blend in with this group of like sneaker heads. Well, me and my buddies and my, my friend actually, uh, my friend Tyler Gray did it with me. And he's a, um, I don't know if you, have you ever met Tyler Gray? The name rings a bell. He was a Delta Force operator. Um, I feel like, I feel like you may have met I him. I think I with, met him. Yeah. Um, but he was doing the course with me because him and I would always just jump in and do and Not that he needed to do it, but he right. he's one of these guys just loves to learn stuff. Um, and so we're asleep and we wake up at like five in the morning and there was probably, I'd say 70 people sleeping in front of the shop, but these, it was clearly a gang had come up from the inner city up to Santa Monica and there was about six of them. And these six gang members, because they were organized, controlled the entire 70 people that were waiting in, in line. They pushed their way to the front. And they were like, nope, this is how it's going to go. We're here for these sneakers. We're getting the sneakers first that we want, and you can't do shit about it. And I went back to Kevin with it, and it was like, it really hammered to me like, wow, a tiny group of organized people can control a much, much larger unorganized group of people. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of scary. They were like, if anyone wants to come and like challenge us, you're going to die right now. Right. Right, and the question is, to what degree is that happening in our culture now? Yeah. To what degree is that happening? You know, what degree are the cartels running Mexico and yeah, all these all these things? And I really, I uh, there's a quote from Frank Lucas, uh, American gangster. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's like, respect is nice, but if you want to get your money, they need to fear you. Yeah, and the power of fear, and and the, and why sociopaths and psychopaths often rise to the top in yeah societies. It's funny. It's like I I think you know to that point, I think. That's, you know, that sentiment is probably why, not to get too conspiracy theory right. here, but like why the government went so hard on the January 6th rioters. You know, they were like, wait, they no longer fear us. The, you know, the, the, the mob essentially just thinks they can come in and roll into the Capitol. And so now they're like, fuck it, we're putting these people away for as long as we can so no one tries to do this again. Yeah, it's true. You have to make an example. If yeah. you don't, if you don't, then whoever has the next idea can go do it. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. have to make an example. And I think it's true. I think there are a lot of people in prison for whatever reason. Uh, it, it could be, I think, for financial crimes to uh, to gang leaders or something that their punishment doesn't fit the crime. Yeah. But they're trying to make an example and make a point. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, yeah. the, it's like the, the, the it's this, it's this equivalent of like public executions back in the day. It's right. like, you know. It's like, so we can meet faith and fear are the two things that operate. Faith that the system works like it's supposed to and then fear that if I question that, I'm in trouble. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just a fucking, it's so, it, it, I think the COVID, that, those, that time, you know, that two and a half, three years. Yeah. It, it, I was discussing this with someone. It's like I, I say it was BC and AC. 
before COVID, after COVID. Oh, I totally, totally, totally. You know? Yeah. No, in fact, when someone says when did that happen, I think oh, I was before COVID. That's literally just a time period. Yeah. yeah. It's a now. It's like a. It's a. It's a marker for the history books because it, the landscape is totally different. Yeah. You know, and and the things that you and I had prepared for of, you know, a war of famine. I didn't. I didn't. I never realistically thought two and a half, three years. You know, for my planning, I was like, okay, like I'm. I'm good for like a grid down six to nine months, but like three you know we, we went nearly three years with it and here's what here's what i didn't let's say prepare for or think of what i wrote emergency but experienced anew with covid which is that the disaster isn't the disaster necessarily it's the people's response to the disaster yes so i'm more scared of people's responses to ai than ai itself yeah you know it's people with ai the danger like there sure is a scenario that ai decides we're irrelevant mm -hmm. or Decide, has some instructions that's supposed to create paper clips and turns the whole universe into paper clips and all those different scenarios around AI, but either people with AI or people's fear of AI or it's our relationship to this stuff that's dangerous. And yeah. same with, you know, and same with COVID people or people were literally, families were disintegrating over a different belief yeah. in something where now they can actually discuss it now that that's over. But it was wild to see us tearing ourselves apart over it. Yeah. Have you thought about writing like a, a part two to emergency? I'm thinking, but I really think it would be more about the psychology yeah. of this stuff, you know, and, and the way people are so quick to see another group of people as evil. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think I think a lot about dark, but I think your podcast is the right place for it. I think a lot about genocide mm -hmm. and what makes one group of people decide that the world would be better off if that group of people didn't exist. Yeah. And then follow through on that or try to. Yeah. And then how close did we, did we get with uh, you got your shot or you didn't get your shot? Right. If you didn't get it, well, you're killing everyone, perpetuating this disease, and you're a murderer. And then if you got it, you're allowing the not only this to mutate, and you're a murderer. Mm -hmm. Or with Trump versus not Trump, I'd see people like Judd Apatow, like great, likable people, post that everyone who likes Trump should go fall into a black hole or something like that. There was yeah. a similar post, um, and uh, and it's so easy. Like just when we're in fear, hate comes so easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. I think it's it, we go back to that primal instinct of you need a tribe up what's your tribe we're scared we're gonna die all right what what's the right tribe to survive in yeah we just everyone reverts back to that in one way or another and we can't deal with uncertainty no there's a <clears throat> there was a study that after 9 11 um that people who had witnessed or experienced it or lost relatives to it had a rightward shift in their policies and were attracted toward an author authoritarian leader who gave them certainty mm. interesting yeah that's fascinating yeah it's interesting right yeah. What, you know, so much of the, the, the work that you do, it kind of dives into subcultures to a degree, you know, it's, you know, yeah. whether it's the, you know, the, the pickup artists, you know, in the game or, I mean, fucking the dirt Motley Crue. I mean, you, you, you do these deep dives into these very kind of unique worlds. Where, where did that come from for you? Yeah, it's a good question. No, no one's ever asked that, though I do that, but no one's ever asked that. So that's interesting. I think it, I mean, probably comes from growing up feeling alienated in your own family, you know, <laughs> and feeling like you don't fit in and trying to find your tribe or your people and getting into subcultures anyway. So I think it comes from that. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably like the psychological origin. And then I find like, I just find, I find, uh, I love secret knowledge that's hidden, you know, <laughs> and getting into some group or some community where they feel like they have all the answers. And, yeah. um, I just find, I just find that fascinating. I think like getting, going where you're not supposed to go. Mm. So I went for the, when I was writing the New York times, I went to, I, I would find some excuse to go where I wanted to go. So I wanted, there was a, I want to write an article. There's a style of music, a folk music that is only made in the mafia in Italy. So I went to like meet with the uh, mafia in Reggio di Calabria in Italy to and, and met, to go to their feasts and write about the music. But really, I'm fascinated by the subculture. And what love, was that like, dude? It was wild. You were straight in yeah. the Italian mafia. Right. What an interesting way in. Right. I have this theory, and I really need to look it up. When I would go to the home of like a mafia mafia don, they'd have like the cliche. They have you know birds everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I have an idea of why. I'm not sure I haven't like Googled it or anything or asked ChatGPT or whatever you do now. But do you have any idea why they have birds all over their house? And... Uh, is it to, in case they were being recorded, the yeah. birds are chirping all the time? That's so... what I think it is. Ah. Yeah. I don't know if that's true, but I realized they all had them. I'm like, why would you have so many fucking birds Interesting. in your house? Um, and there was, it was so, uh, and I remember like I went to, I went to one 
like mafia feast. And after I was interviewing the mafia don and I said, well, as the head of this group and he's like, I'm not in the mafia. I'm like, I just saw you like talk to the whole mafia. Like he's <laughs> like, nope, I'm not. And I love how they could just like charmingly lie to your face. And even within the mafia, there's just divisions. There's like, well, we're the old mafia. We have honor and, uh, you know, respect women and children. The new mafia doesn't have that. Mm. So in any subculture you get into, there are these, di these divisions that were at that other, another group. Wow. Well, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, uh, you know, everyone kind of clicks up no matter what, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, a business is the same way. You know, you've got the old, you know, the old timers in some corporate, you know, structure that all kind of hang together and want nothing to do with the new guys. And yeah. Really yeah. And if you can, if you can be unattached and we see this now with the, this generation or this, the whole Twitter divide on woke, anti-woke or whatever, mm -hmm. it's like, just, it's literally like, if you can hold your beliefs loosely, you're going to be a lot happier. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. It's like, don't. Don't live and die on a certain hill because that hill is always going to change. It's it's going to change, and people can't accept that. Like yeah. my son, and I'm sure it's true of your kids. Like again, we're like touching all the tropes of of our culture, but whatever. You know, my son's like he's totally cool with whatever you know, gender choice people choose to make and how it is and how they, he doesn't give a shit because he's raised in this generation. Yeah, and the other people who are so certain this is the way it is, like why are you certain? That's just a belief you were born with. It's all yeah. it's all made up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no, there's no real, you know, there's no true parameters. I mean, there's definitely weird, you right. know, there's definitely some shit you can look at and go, yeah, that's fucking weird, but whatever. Yeah. That's, and that's kind of where, you know, where I'm at. I just don't like, I just don't like when the, the theoretical is being taught as fact. And it's like, just leave it as theoretical because so much of society is theoretical. Don't sit there and be like, no, this is fact now. You're like... Yeah, but like last week it wasn't fact. Isn't the theoretical always being taught as fact? It's, it's <laughs> right? yeah. Like, like there's so few facts. I mean, literally, if you read a history book now versus a history book we grew up on, it's completely different. Even the names, I think for us, is the Revolutionary War. Now it's the War for American Independence. And yeah. Like even the names of stuff we changed, we would fail every oh, history fully. test now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all like, there's so little fact. Yeah. You know, with the... You know, when the game came out, it was very much like a uh, that ignited like a wait, wait, we had a transition back well, into but, me. No, yes. but like I'm just thinking <laughs> yeah. like it kinda it, it plays to that. Right. Like it that started like very much a cultural revolution and then, you know, amongst kind of young single guys trying to figure out, okay, how do I how do I get a woman? And where like, you know, there was there a level of backlash in kind of the post Me Too world with that? Um I think that I mean the game's an interesting book, which is which was about my sort of journey into the secret world to pick up artists. I think you met some of them. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Yeah, I, I randomly at one point ended up staying at their like house in Austin one night uh -huh. many many years ago. Right, it was right. very strange. I was, was like, so why am I funny. here? Um, and uh, I mean, I think sex sex is such a uh, sensitive topic to ever touch <clears throat> because I was thinking the other day like we're we sexualize everything in this culture at the expense of our sexuality. <laughs> you know, like we sort of turn everything into a story around that. And uh, and so I found that book was just a, a big projection for whatever people or the culture feel from that day to from that day to now. Mm. Um, so and to me, like, <clears throat> I mean, you've read it. So the book begins with the greatest pickup artist in the world about to kill himself. Yeah. Mystery and ends really saying like this is and basically with toxic mask a version of to toxic masculinity and all these fake alpha males and living in this house fighting each other like lord of the flies because they're living by this f messed up code mm -hmm. so to me i feel like a lot of the reaction against the book and again i haven't reread it maybe it's all totally deserved but i feel like it's wasn't ever the, to me the intention or theme of the book yeah so i feel like i don't it's know if the the reaction is the face value of the book it's not the actual Core right. of the book. Like it's a mirror for stuff, it, it, which was out of my control. I mean, I did a, I just co wrote a book with Rick Rubin called The Creative Act. Mm. And uh, it's been like super exciting. It's been on the bestseller list for like 27 weeks. Wow. But it has nothing to do with anything anyone's done in the sense that like Rick's so amazing. He's never tweeted about it or put it on his Instagram, you know, did a couple of cultural things. But it just, it's out of your control. When you throw something in the culture, it's out of your control how people interpret it whether it does well or not and yeah. you just move on to the next thing. What's the what's the what's the book about? Um it's a it's really cool. It's a I spent like a probably worked on it for almost 4 years but it's Rick's just the distilled essence of Rick's wisdom or philosophy mm. and creativity 
uh, and it's almost sort of a spiritual, inspirational book on creativity. Different than anything. I'll get you. I'll give you a copy. It's cool. different than anything I've done. But um, let me ask you a question related to what you were saying about the game. Mm -hmm. When you get criticized online or in the media or whatever it is, um, would you rather which stings more, when they're right or when they're wrong? I think when they're wrong. Oh, really? Because for me, it's when they're right. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Well, I guess I, I, I guess it's a thing if you're being criticized about something that is not an accurate crit. Like if they're totally, you know, oh, he said that. You're like, no, I never said that, and you're going nuts at me for it. Like at least if you're gonna, uh, you know, I, I guess I would want to be in your shoes of like I want to get pissed off if you're mad at me for something I did do versus I didn't do. Right. Yeah. So you get so that's that's for you like that stings more when they don't like your essentially your your truth. Or no, or no, or the, or the example. I guess let me think of that example. Okay, so the person I did it after the game, at Lisa. I think, did you ever meet Lisa? She was a guitarist in Courtney Love's band, and I don't think so. So no. she's kind of the end of the game is her and I getting into a relationship, and for some reason, like there was this story in the media that she left me for Robbie Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it got out there, but it's funny because it was just funny. There's like British media parked outside our house, people like all kinds of crazy stuff, and and uh, and. You know, and in that game world of masculine, like it's very, uh, you're cuckolded, you're a cuck, right? Yeah. Or whatever it is. I don't know what the thing is, but, you know, it really, but I thought it was just funny. I thought it was funny. Mm. But maybe if it really happened, it would hurt, be hurtful, <laughs> right? Because it'd be a painful <laughs> moment. Or or simply if I make a, if I say something wrong or make a mistake in a book and it's kind of called out, I think it hurts more if, like, it really is true. I learned, you learn from it, but I think if it's true, yeah. um, you know, it hurts more than if it's just if it's made up. It's kind of funny and it blows over. I think I think in the end the truth wins out in the end. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we've really seen our culture change. Yeah. To to uh, in in these ways that are we've just seen a change. I mean, yeah. I'm a, I'm a doing a project and so studying Russian history for this project. Oh, nice. And it, but it's interesting. It's just interesting to watch how quickly a culture can change and that one belief that puts you at the top of the culture can then be the belief that puts you at the bottom of the culture mm -hmm. or in prison within like two years. Yeah. 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 It's, are you, what, is it, uh, can you talk about the project? I, I can tell you off mic. It's, okay. it's wild though. It's okay. so, it's so wild. Cool. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's also very like um, karmic in the sense of what we've been talking mm -hmm. about. So, you know, the other side is like obviously you know, we just keep growing and learning from what we do. So it's very karmic in the sense of the things we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, Pete, who I work with, his son is, I think he's like 10, and he's fascinated with Russian history. Yeah. And it's so odd. He's like, loves the whole, you know, kind of pre-revolution, but like goes deep dive into it and knows all these crazy facts. I'm like, you're a 10-year-old kid. Like, what do you care about like <laughs> the, the Russian like, you know, czars and all that? It's wild because the things you learn are, are one, and this is really interesting in terms of the things we're talking about in our culture, is that the group, there's, to the groups that want fairness and equality, the, the, it just seems every revolution, things are, un, people are suffering and things are unfair, just factually true. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, it seems, is that the, that some group rises to power and creates a new unfairness mm -hmm. where the people were, and then there's just a new group that has all the power and the privilege and yeah. another one that doesn't. And 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 then they will murder a lot of people to try and enforce the way it should be. So mm -hmm. you know, again, if you read the Marx, you know, the 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 Communist Manifesto, the Communist Manifesto, or or the the Marx Engels book, uh, or essays, or whatever they are, um, manifestos, um, and then you compare it to what happened. It wasn't meant for like some small elite to be in charge. Like, yeah, the workers are supposed to be in charge, but then they were. I'm reading now about that. They're just there are these ideas to turn the workers into complete robots, like talking to Pavlov about how can we get rid of their emotions, and, <laughs> you know, and get rid of independent thinking and it, things like that. Isn't and, that why there's fluoride yeah. in the water? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's wild that, um, you know, just I think the disease of power in humanity and how how hard people work to get it, keep it, and make sure no one else has it yeah. throughout history. Yeah. Um, Sorry, but we can we can get out of this loop because it's so we can talk about this forever. Oh, yeah. So no, we I can talk it. about the uh, <laughs> grit and well, dude, all right, grit. Where where <laughs> yes. do you think your grit comes from? Because um, you are like you know Neil, like you are a surprisingly gritty guy. 
Correct. You know, you 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 roll your sleeves up and you you dive deep into these worlds, which most people either don't have the stomach for or just uh, can't wrap their head around. And you just you you barrel right in there. Where do you think that comes from? Yeah. Explain the surprising part. I'm trying to decide whether to be offended or not. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to decide well, whether this is a truth a, to be offended by or a false thing. That's but your like problem. A, a New York <laughs> yeah. Times journalist. Okay. Right. Yes, you are like an investigative journalist, but right. like I mean, on face value, it's like you know you're. You, you know, you, if I were to see you, didn't know you down the street, I'd be like, okay, that guy works in like the arts. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. Totally, totally. And like, maybe he can lift a weight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I, I think, I think it comes, I think it comes, I don't know, this may, it sounds like a road answer in my head, but thinking out loud is, I think it comes from curiosity. If I get curious about something, mm -hmm. like I need to know the answer, like at any cost. So if they, I think if I'm curious about something, that's part of it. And maybe it's the that if I give up or I don't follow it through, I don't see it through, I'm not happy with myself. Mm. So so if I start something, I need to finish it. Yeah. And if I say I'm going to do this, I really need to do it. So I think that grit comes from like, yeah, just not letting go. Until, perseverance. Yeah, perseverance. I think it's I think it's perseverance. Is that something that you had as a child, or is that something that you had developed over time? Yeah, good question. I'm trying to think if I had. Um, yeah, it's like, it's not like I had a, it's not like I had a father figure that taught me that, mm. uh, at all. I mean, again, I think it's more, um, it's more like, I think my house was like a fascist system, <laughs> you know, that, uh, and maybe that's my, my interest is in the, while I'm reading about all these other, other things. I think my house was a fascist system you had to sort of survive in. Mm. Where, where did you, you grow up? Choice. In Chicago. Okay. Yeah. And so you really didn't have a choice. What was said went, and if you disobeyed the consequences were extreme mm. you know you're sent to the yeah the gulag yeah exactly <laughs> i mean that's it i don't know if anyone has read the gulag archipelago book i um i actually have it downloaded because of, of you know my it's a isn't it like a 1200 page book yeah um my buddy was like dude you got to read it you got to get into it and so i have it downloaded i just haven't cracked it yet there, there's a, there's an abridged version that was written with Solzhenitsyn's sort of consent. Mm -hmm. And if you just get the audiobook of that, okay. it's it's just, it's insane, the stories. And I think sometimes reading about this can make, you can see what to, what to be grateful for in mm -hmm. our culture instead of feeling like, like you were saying, are you, uh, fuck man, they'd be fucking grateful for cancel culture there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, like, like I'd, like, you know what I mean? So when you ask if you're afraid of these things, it isn't that they're, there are intense consequences to them. There are horrible consequences to them for people, both psychologically and you know financially, and all kinds of ways. Mm. But it's still better than being in the gulag. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. I so, mean, it, it... so so it's it's all fucking relative. Yeah. You know, is it is that you know it's it's just all relative. So remembering what to be, what what are real consequences? Like, yeah, what are real consequences? Well, it's the and it's that, and I always say it's like anyone when whenever I sit there and I see someone saying you know. This place sucks. America is so fucking problematic, and fuck this, fuck that. And I'm like, have you been anywhere else? You know, a lot of these people you see on the soapbox screaming about how screwed up this place is. You're like, hey, there are some much, much worse places than this. Not saying that's an excuse yeah. for the shit that happens yeah. here, but like, like, fucking go, go check out some of those places, and you might rethink like how shit goes. Yeah, we have a desire. To, I always think about that. We have a desire to make it better, but can we at least like, what if we just agreed as a as a, as a world and a collective of people to say, let's just see if we can get everyone wherever they are, just having food, shelter, access to basic health care. Mm -hmm. Just the can we just get everyone the necessities? Just everyone the necessities, then let's go attack get on this other stuff. But let's just do that as the ground level stuff, yeah. the way we try to have a basic education or basic knowledge or something. But if we can give everybody those, because I don't know how much the world doesn't have it, but it's a large oh, percentage gosh, yeah. if you travel. Now I remember kind of you told me that you were doing a lot of breath work stuff. Right. Are you still Are you still uh, in breath? I'm, I'm still breathing. Yeah. Still breathing. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. There's there's two kinds of breath work I'm really into. One one is one is just just breathing as a r regulation, whether you're doing some sort of the Wim Hofy type of stuff. And mm -hmm. then there's the holotropic breath work. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done that? <sighs> I'm trying to think. You would know. Necessarily. I would know. Okay. Because I, I do I do do I just don't necessarily know what it's called. Maybe is it the one where it's like an hour long and you literally have an almost psychedelic experience. One hundred percent, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like my, I, I. It's really weird when you're I, doing your hands. Your hands. Yeah. My, up. my, my hands curl up. I, uh, yeah, dude, I'll cry like whole thing. Right. Yeah. yeah that it's the great. It's as far as like trauma healing goes. I think that 
doing the holotropic breath work, which is it's an hour and you do this, you sort of breathe and it's really work because it is work, mm -hmm. perseverance and grit to breathe through the whole thing. Yeah. And they sort of, you sort of go on this ride and by just breathing, shit starts unlocking in your body. It's, yeah. It's like that Bessel van der Kolk book, The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. So we were used to talk therapy and it's about our thinking and this bypasses the thinking. All of a sudden weird memories surface or trapped. Again, my house was, like I was saying, we were very tightly controlled. So I, my hands start just moving because I couldn't, I couldn't freely move or yeah. strike out or something. So it's, it's really great to do. And it's a, it's, to me, it's safer than a, a plant medicine type of stuff because mm -hmm. you can just, if it's too much, you can just, stop breathing leave it at any time yeah yeah do you um so yeah the i usually do it was the, the pranayama two stage uh -huh. is is the what i i have done the most of when yeah. i do breath work um but i mean it's i was there was a there was a phase where i was like really like hitting it hard and uh, you know I'll, I'll dip into a breath work like I've, i have a group of guys that i do it with and i'll go in like you know once every two three weeks you know we meet on like a tuesday or a sunday and you know, do the breath work and then fire and ice. And uh, oh, that's great. I yeah. got I got the sauna cold. It's it's so weird, man. And I, by the way, I think Stan Groff, if I get his name correctly, is the one who really pioneered this type of breath work mm. back at Esalen in the '60s. I don't know how I know all this shit, but <laughs> but <laughs> well, because you're an investigator, yeah, exactly, research. exactly. If I get into it, I need to know who did it. Like I love EMDR for therapy, and uh -huh. I wanted to go meet before she passed away, Francine Shapiro, who created that. So I really get into these things, but yeah. it's so weird. Why do you and I get such parallel interests? I know it is really <laughs> odd. It yeah. is. It's funny. Like I, yeah, yeah it's, uh, yeah, and it's always at similar times too. Yeah. We're kind of like you know ships, kind of on the on on the same body of water, just over the horizon. So, what problem in our lives are we trying to solve? That, that... Man, I yeah, it's a great question. I, yeah. uh, I think for me, you know, it's just about just trying to experience everything in a weird way. Like, yeah. oh, I wonder what's that that's like, you know, can I do that? Is that possible? Is it because we, we are afraid to look at ourselves and be alone with ourselves? I oh, mean I really mean that. Yeah, no, I um there's there is there is definitely an element of that for me. Like I I am not good just being alone. Like I'm not good with, you know, idle hands of the devil's tools. You know, I have to constantly be doing something if if I have time at home to just by myself, I'm playing a video game to distract myself. It's you know, I love having a ton of kids because it. I'm occupied. I have to do you know this, that, and the other. It's you know, it, uh, yeah. I don't. I'm not good alone. So, so are you scared of a silent retreat? Um, I. It's terrifying to me, but I. I do want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, it's like, funny. That's the one thing you haven't done. Yeah, yeah. I want to do. I. Uh, is that is that the papashna? Is it the pasana? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. My, my. I have friends that have done it, and they were loved it. Have you done? Uh, have you done the dark room? Like the. No, I want to do that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's it, funny how we'll do these other intense things, but we'll take this the silent one. We'll. Yeah. Last. Yeah, I had a I had a friend who did it, and he said it was, it was it was mind boggling. I just, man, I'm. Like I have to go to sleep listening to a podcast or watching TV because if I lay there with my eyes closed and I'm not occupying, I'm not occupied. Like my head just starts screaming. Right. What and what do you what do you think and what do you think you're afraid of that will happen or the thought that will happen or the dark place you'll go to or I think it's probably just either coming to terms with things. I think it's probably that you know it's it's I think it it is maybe rooted in my my isms. Um, yeah, it's, uh, ever since I, you know, ever since I was a kid, it took me a long time to figure out how to fall asleep. I, I could, I was a terrible sleeper as a kid. I was, I would stay up hours and hours and hours because I couldn't turn my head off. And it wasn't until I found, uh, talk radio at night to listen to, to fall asleep that I really go, oh, that's how I sleep. And that was in my mid, mid to late twenties. Yeah. To yeah. really, and it's an odd thing to kind of live that long in your life going, I don't know how to fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, and I wonder too with this, so maybe you are you have an intensity addiction yeah. now in the way you had the other addictions before. Yeah, I absolutely, I mean, you could, my, my good friend Tyler, we talk about that. We're addicted to chaos. Right. Like, I, I fucking love chaos. Like, the idea of chaos, living in chaos, like, I... You know, I don't know what I would do without a certain hum of chaos in my life. But then when you're in the chaos, do you have a complaint? Like, I just wish 
what's your complaint? Like, I just wish this, I just need some peace. I need, I need a break. Yeah. And I think that's probably why I, I do things like fire and ice and why I do, you know, breath work stuff, because I think it's a way to digest, digest some of that to where it doesn't physically manifest. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about it. So maybe, maybe, maybe our thing then is to just do a year of doing nothing. Yeah. Fuck. Can you imagine? I'd have to do something. Right. I mean, maybe you, planting a garden. They just, just, yeah, just, yeah, just, just, but you'd be like, you, you'd be like, it's gonna be the best garden and I've studied all the, <laughs> you know, ways to plant these so they grow the best. Like yeah. you would, you would like, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so listen, what, what are we going to commit to then? The Vipassana or the dark room this year? Okay. Let's do three days in dark and then we'll do seven days. Start with seven. I think it'll be great. I think, I think you'll get to insights about yourself and your life that you haven't had before just because it's another way to access yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And it's scary. Like I feel it in my body. Oh dear. yeah. I'm like fuck, going to bed. I, cause I, so I just did this. Um, imagine stillness, this, imagine stillness, Jack. I can't, I, yeah. I really, I had, uh, I just did this show for Fox. It was this special forces selection show for, uh, for Fox. And, um, I was one of the contestants on it and being at night, just laying there in the black room when it was time to go to bed, I couldn't turn my head off. So I'm I'm curious to what seven days would look like. Yeah, yeah. And if you could eventually turn your head off. Yeah. Like, yeah. I feel like something will snap. You'll have some breakthrough mm. of some sort. And the question is, can you hold on to it afterward? That's my biggest thing I see is people, <clears throat> they come back from these things and they're literally glowing. They're mm -hmm. new people, but then the same old forces in the environment get on them, whether it's the family stuff, work stuff, all the same forces. Or It's like someone getting out of rehab. Yeah. Right, and then the same environmental forces press on them, and they revert. Mm -hmm. So if we do it, maybe you join the men's group I'm in, and we'll stay accountable to our new okay. stuff. Okay, I'm yes. in. Okay, cool. Have you uh, have you done any of the plant medicine stuff? Um, no, I got like I got dosed by an evil shaman. <laughs> what? No joke, for real. Yeah, accidentally and, or on purpose? I mean, on purpose for them, and accidentally for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. So, so, and then it's. I have some like psychedelic PTSD. Oh, okay. So I haven't. Have you? Um. Okay. So yes, uh, and I don't. I don't really talk about it because you know I've been sober like twenty years. Right. And but I have, you know, I did go. You know, I have gone down the um, plant medicine path uh, to kind of deal with certain kind of traumas that uh, therapy and you know, wasn't really getting to the root of. And um, it was fucking amazing. Amazing. Like yeah. totally 180'd, you know, w you know, where I was at. Yeah, I mean, that that's another kind of philosophy. I wonder what, it'd be interesting to see a sort of AA debate on, yeah. on that because you're not supposed to do anything that's mood mm -hmm. altering. Yeah, and nothing from the neck up. And nothing, yeah. And I've seen people who were addicts have transformative experiences. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people become addicted to plant medicines thinking that they're healthy yeah and doing it every weekend all the time and just going out of their heads yeah no it's very true what, what did you do which one so i did um i did uh three yahe ceremonies which is colombian ayahuasca yeah there's a great book by william burroughs called the yahe letters or something oh really yeah that's cool oh, wow. and that, that was and that was like the original ayahuasca back in the yeah. day yeah yeah um and i got plugged in with this group and they the Taita comes up from uh, from Colombia, and you know it's it was really uh, it was awesome, really like super traditional, and then gnarly about it. They're like, wow. no, this isn't like a your Hollywood shaman. This is like, you know, the real. And it was cool, and it was painful, and it sucked, and incredibly profound. And um, and then I did a um, I did a San Pedro ceremony, um, which was. Which was amazing, very, right. very different, very gentle, and um, right because that like like ayahuasca is the mother and San Pedro is like the father. Exactly, right? yeah. And then uh, I I've done a, a like a psilocybin uh, ceremony, and that was actually probably I had more of kind of a download from that than the ayahuasca or the San Pedro. Like that was like interesting. Wow, like realized some things about kind of myself. You know the loved ones in my life, kind of. You know, it was it was amazing. Wow. Have you? Would you ever do ibogaine? Um, ibogaine is the frog. Is that oh the, no, that's iboga. That's I think, iboga. I think. Yeah. Wait, I think. Or the frog. Or the frog. No, the frog ones. Um. Uh. Sorry. There's toad. You're, there's 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 toad, which is the five meo DMT, yes. which is like the 
20 minute trip on the outside and then inside it's like who knows how long yeah where the structure of the universe breaks open yep uh and then um uh then there's combo which is the frog mm-hmm. but ibogaine is the one where people go who are junkies yes go to wherever a clinic in mexico or where have mm-hmm. you and it's i think it's a really long trip mm-hmm. um and you you work a lot of the steps in the trip i hear like yeah. people have done it where like i literally was apologizing to someone that i cut off like that I couldn't even remember cutting off in traffic or having road rage about that I literally couldn't remember, but I'm in apologizing to them in this <laughs> in this. But I hear it's like very much like going into death and out of death and yeah. very intense. Yeah, I had I had a similar experience with like going into death with with ayahuasca and that was that was very uh it I think it all it all serves its purpose. And it's always come up in my life at a time that was just like as they as they you the the terminology they use in the in that community is you know you, you were called to it right. it was like hey like now and i was getting i've been getting i was getting invited to ayahuasca ceremony since 2004 like the year i got like year after i got sober you know someone was like hey do you want to come do this thing and then i was like no i can't i can't and then like every couple years and then during my divorce i was in such a shitty dark horrible place and i was like up ag- i was like i couldn't get out of this and and a a very good friend of mine is um he's very much committed to the kind of the way of yahe and um and i reached out and i was like hey man like do you think this is something that would would help and you know and i spoke with you know my, my therapist and my sponsor and we kind of all kind of got to like all right what is my why behind it why am i doing this is this like a are you are you actually looking for relief and answers or are you looking to go get fucked up and it was very much looking for relief and answers yeah, but it sounds like like you did it 100% for the therapeutic oh. right reason. What was your big, you don't have to give us the context, yeah. but what was your big epiphany or takeaway from it? I I think my biggest from, well, it's weird. So the first, the first ayahuasca ceremony, I think my big takeaway was like, I just, it allowed me to purge the pain of my divorce. Just because I'm, I'm not a crier. You know, I grew up in England where it was like when you cried at school, teachers would be like, no, we don't cry here. We don't do that. Like it, it, you know, being a Brit, it's emotions aren't something you necessarily wear on your sleeve. And so just kind of having that space to just let it all out was, um, was, was awesome. And I just needed it. And like this shaman lady just like held me and I just cried and cried and cried. And it was just, I needed that. Well, maybe that's why the afraid of sight, maybe you hold the stuff in. And yeah. that's the fear of the silence or the fear of not being intensity that you, there's stuff you're kind of holding in and not releasing or acknowledging fully. And the only way out is through. Yeah. I, yeah. Need, I need a bit of uh, I need a bit of rocket fuel to, to, you know, to, to, to launch that emotion. I mean, I think that's like, you know, again, I think we talked a lot about the, <clears throat> you know, the game and emergence and that kind of stuff, but like where I'm at and maybe where you're at now too. And I think like the whole world is here now, but I did that book, the truth, which was like, healing my own trauma what mm-hmm. what drew me to that world of pickup artists what hold that i have in myself um and i really realized that if you you're like a software program and you're you're running on a flawed op, you're running on an operating system that has some bugs and viruses in it mm-hmm. and they were sort of implanted by your caregivers or early experiences growing up and until you can kind of identify them <clears throat> see how they're taking you off your path and messing you up <clears throat> you're not really free. Yeah. Yeah. It, no, it's, I mean, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. It's, uh, and I, you know, and it's funny. It's like, I wonder, you know, it, to that point, you know, you ask like, why, why do we do these things? What draw it? Maybe, right. maybe it's, maybe it's looking for freedom. Yeah. You know, maybe that's, that's what it's about. And freedom from what for you? Well, as they, you know, it's the as the, as they say in you know a lot of AA literature, it's like the freedom of bondage of self. Right. It's like I I need I I need. You know, I'm I have something bound up within me, and and I and I have to free it somehow. And what that is, you know, is it is it filling that god sized hole with only God? You know, right. I don't know. You know, yeah. is it filling it with you know love of family or, you know, job or I don't know. Yeah, it's a good thought. So going back to the, I'm just thinking as you're talking, <laughs> like, we, but uh, but I do I do think going back to motivations and stuff, I think I probably have a lot of low hanging anxiety, mm. and then if I'm focused on a project or focused on a task or focused on a climbing a mountain or whatever it is, I can 
focus all that energy there and escape from the anxiety. Even the cold, the greatest thing about the cold bath is your body's in fake survival mode all the time. You know, the things we're talking about, what if this happens? What if that happens? What about that? Or, oh, that's so scary. And then you're, or I have all this work to do. And if I'm not at this thing on time, and what if this doesn't succeed? Then you get in the cold bath and your body's like, oh no, this is real survival mm -hmm. threat. This is an actual threat. The cold, uh, all that stuff is just made up shit. And I think it, it uh, allows you to let go of that and see what a real threat is. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, you see, you just walk around the street, especially in LA here, and you just look at people's faces and the things they're talking about. And they have so much anxiety and stress over shit that doesn't matter. Yep. And they're living their life out of that. And they're like wasting their life out of that. Yeah. And I swear, man, like, f and fucking, and then you know what happens? Like the universe might deal you a car. Well, you've been through this. And so I'll ask you about it. Like the deal, universe deals you a, deals you a really harsh lesson where your life is on the line or you're sick or something. And a lot of people make these revel, revel, re, big revelations, big resolutions about what they're going to do. And then they're healthy again. And they go back to the same old shit. Mm. So I'm curious, like you've dealt with some major health stuff. Yeah, sure. Did you have insights and did you hold on to the insights? Yeah, I mean, I did have I did have insights. I did try and do the, oh, okay, you got MS. You have to like change this, change that, minimize stress, eat right, exercise, this, that, and the other. And I think for me where I've ended up, you know, 11 years in is just fucking charge. Don't don't take anything for granted because it's you know i have a very mild form of ms but it's the 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 thing with it it can get bad at any point there's no rhyme or reason and doctors really don't know what causes you know causes it to to get worse you know flare up whatever and so i just try and it's like a bit of seize the day mentality of like cool like i you know i try and just ma i try and maximize which in turn can cause a lot of stress, which right. isn't good, but it's the only thing that's kind of, I think for me, that's really was made apparent was like, you're not guaranteed, you're not guaranteed like, you know, mobility when you're an old man. So right. I guess for me, I, I, I don't, I don't want to take that for granted. Yeah. Yeah. We take so much shit for granted. hundred like, percent. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I did an exercise. I'm able, interesting exercise, which is I had a group of, and people can do it at home. Um, and, uh, it comes from a friend, uh, she has a book coming out. I wish I could remember what the name of the book was right now, but anyway, um, I'll try to remember so we can put it in the notes, but, but the idea was, what are you doing? If you had a year left to live, what would you do? Then six months left to live, what would you do? Mm. Then like, maybe it's a week, maybe 24 hours left to live. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you can kind of see what's in common on those lists. But the crazy thing is if you look at people's list of a year left to live, what they, what would they do or something? Like they're doing almost none of those, mm. you know, or they're doing it at such a ridiculously slow pace. Yeah. And we do take for granted. And so one of my like goals lately has been like, really, what are the things I love? What's important with my time? And to just reduce your life to those. Yeah. It's and so, it's so important. Who is it? I forget who is it that they have this like digital calendar thing where it shows you how many weeks. Oh, it's a uh, Tim Urban. Yes. Yeah. In a weird way. Is it Tim Urban? I think. I think so. He has like a he has like a infographic. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, and it's like you know if you live to eighty five and you're you know in your forties, like this is how many weeks you have till you're eighty five. I kind of, in a weird way, I looked at that and I was like, "Fuck you!" Like that's bullshit. Like don't re don't boil it down to like little week. I don't know. It just it it. it you made know, you angry. It made me angry. Yeah. And I don't know why. Right. Like, I just like, and I keep thinking about it. It just, I right. can't, I'm like, cause really like. You felt manipulated? In a, in a weird way. Like yeah. Using like fear tactics on you. Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. that's exactly what it is. That, that, that's a, <laughs> that's an item that is so rooted in fear. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, it's funny. I did it. And I'm like, oh shit, I got a lot of weeks left. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh cool. There's still a lot of, a lot of X's left. I probably live in the moment where I think I'm going to die at any yeah. time. So I was like, oh, I got a lot. Of... But the fact is like, who the fuck knows? Like yeah. anything can happen. Like totally. we got, we got Russia and with all kinds of nuclear bombs, like we Pandemics. really, yeah. And when they say like, you can, it's just like, life is so fucking uncertain. And I think we can spend all our time trying to get certainty so we feel psychologically safe yeah. or just accept the uncertainty and then live like as best as we can within that. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I just think how many people on their deathbeds are like, fuck, 
I just pointed my life in the wrong direction and wasted it. To and that and that ultimately, and I've said this for years, I do not want to be on my deathbed and going, fuck, why didn't I do that? Yeah. Fuck, why did I why did I do that? Like I don't want that. Like and, I, Well, you know what you're gonna be thinking about? What? How much time you spent with your kids. Yeah. And the quality of that time. Yeah. Yeah. Where where do you where do you lie with uh, kind of death, afterlife? This kind of transitions us very nicely. Okay, yeah, to the okay, ghost okay. Let's, let's hit ghost, and then we've hit all, all, all yeah. your things. I feel like they should be two separate podcasts because grit and ghost are I know. so different. Besides. They're so different, but that's why I did it because it's kind of like it it spans my interests. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But I guess if you have a, a paranormal belief, it takes a lot of grit to stick with it in the face of yeah. Uh, of, of all this stuff. So wait, so where do I stand on- Where do you stand? Oh, life after death. Life after death, apparent, like, you know, ghosts. Do you think that's a thing? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I, I think it comes down to uncertainty. Like, mm -hmm. I really accept that we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I've had, definitely had like, I mean, if, I, but I'm also so curious about this stuff. I've been to UFO conventions and talked to people who are abducted. Wow. Yeah, I've- been with like uh, remote viewers, psychic spies trained by the government and learned how to remote view from them. Uh, so I, I've gone to the Von Roe Institute and tried to have out-of-body experiences. So wow. I, I like fully- did, did you have an out-of-body experience? Um, I didn't. A lot of people did. I just couldn't lift off. <laughs> like I felt like, felt like whatever it is trying to rise, but everyone, it was very interesting. People would, so the Monroe Institute was founded by this guy, Robert Monroe. Do you know about this? No. So he was like a, I'm going to get the story wrong, but just so the story is like a general sense of it. So he was sort of a very uh, white collar kind of worker, square guy in the, I don't know, we'll say the 1950s or something. I'm totally butchering this, but uh, fortunately they probably don't have enough money to sue us. So, no, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, um, and he was just in his room. He started having these out of body experiences. And so he founded this institute to study it. So you mm -hmm. can go there, at least you could, I haven't checked if it's still open. I assume it is. You could go there and they go in these little pot and you go there to have out of body experiences. They talk to you about it. Then they put you in these little pods. They'll play. Uh, he does a lot of the hemi, hemi sync binaural beats yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. stuff. And they'll have his voice playing and he'll try to help you lift off and have these experiences and you go up to talk about them. Wow. Um, and you'll love this because it gets into Ghost. They have like a, I think it's called the Explorers Program is this one I did with, um, do you know Chris Holmes? No. Great, just great guy. Uh, used to play like keyboards in the Smashing Pumpkin Chicago okay. magician, musician, but the same kind of mind like us. You should have him on. He'd be a great guest. Okay. Uh, so, so they also have this program, I guess that advanced program where they go to haunted houses and they go into their out of body state and try to communicate with the ghosts and like set them free. And they have like recordings of people talking with the ghosts and wow. setting them free. We were a bit upset about that because it really ruins the haunted houses of, <laughs> of the country. <laughs> really? Wow, you guys really killed this place. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like we have no haunted houses left. But <laughs> but it's so but it's super interesting and it's super fun to do. Parts are parts were like a little woo woo mm -hmm. for me, but it was also like. I, I think it's cool just to try this stuff going back to where you're uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's funny. It's like, cause I've had so many, you know, so many experiences where, you know, my kind of rational, logical, like kind of science rooted brain tries to sit there and be like, no, that's not possible. But like, you know, when I've been in places with like a flashlight on a table being like, hey, if there's a ghost here, turn that flashlight on, the fucking flashlight turns on. It's like, what? what is that? You know, am I, is that, am I using some kind of telepathic power? Is that, am I just plugging into the matrix or is it a ghost? Is it, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, really like if you look at how many very credible people have had very incredible experiences, mm -hmm. it's large. I think like Muhammad Ali had like 27 UFO encounters, according to him. Wow. You know, Jimmy Carter had <clears throat> UFO encounters when he became president. He was like, I'm going to like declassify this information. Mm -hmm. I think Ronald Reagan had something like that that he was investigating. So, so many, so many people have these experiences and, but we can't logically understand them. So we, yeah. I mean, you can talk to anyone and they've had something they can't explain. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like we keep getting close about declassifying this information and letting it out, but we never somehow get the answers. You know, it's funny. I think the, you know, releasing the UFO stuff right now, I just look at it as a stagger. It's all staggered disclosure. It's right. like, um, it's like what doctors are trained to do. If uh, I forget someone, I had a therapist tell me this, that she trained doctors 
on how to give parents the bad news that their child had died. And what the issue was, like, I guess all these parents were having these horribly traumatic experiences from the doctor, like, sorry, your child didn't make it, like, right off the bat when the kid, you know, oh, it was a car accident, your kid, like, you know, brought him in and, you know, he's dead. Like, they, they train doctors now to come out and be like, hey, your son's in the operating room, we're working on him, you know, we're, we're trying to figure it out. And then, you know, 30 minutes later, they'll come out. Hey, you know, he's he's not he's not doing great. We're still working on him. We're still trying to figure out all the while that this child has, you know, expired. And but they slowly will release the kind of horrible news to the parents that like, hey, ultimately your child has passed. But they do it in a way which allows time for parents to start rationalizing and processing and kind of coming to terms with this what ultimately is terrible news. I think it makes sense. It makes less of a trauma. I think of that with children's raising children too. If you, you know, if you sit your children down, you tell them the news that you're divorcing or whatever it is, it's a big, impactful, traumatic experience yeah. versus <clears throat> slow, these things kind of slowly happening. So they seem like a natural part of life. Yeah. Trauma is something that happens so suddenly and just shocks the system and creates a real scar. Yeah. <clears throat> so I do like that idea of just gradual steps into something that's unthinkable or painful yeah and i and i think that's exactly what the government's doing with the ufo stuff every cut you know every six months oh more information more more footage more oh a congressional hearing now where them some whistleblowers are like oh no we've got aliens and this that but it's always been if you notice at this stage it was like what i've kind of seen it as oh the government has now released this footage we don't know what it is and then you know, the pilots that shot the footage came out to be like, yeah, I, I, I captured that footage. And now you've got whistleblowers who heard from someone that there's aliens and there's, you know, non-human living specimens, as they, whatever they called it. And so I think the next step is that you're going to be, there's going to be a whistleblower at a congressional hearing that's been like, no, I handled the non-human and I think that's just how they're going to just slowly roll right. it out. So in a year, it's just going to be normal to be going to the Smithsonian and seeing the alien bodies. Yeah, it's going to be flight. great. Right? Yeah. yeah. But I do I do think you're right. I think it's it's like, how do we titrate the information yeah. so that someone's system can handle it? Yeah. I mean, really, we like I believe that we are, we are the most adaptable species mm -hmm. and we can kind of adapt to any kind of... Yeah, information, but we're also the most hysterical species if it happens quickly, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It's so true. Like, yeah. uh, I mean, with the ghost stuff, I sometimes think, am I a part of some high-level psyop because I make ghost shows for Discovery? And has Discovery been told to make these ghost shows by the government to slowly kind of get everyone used to the fact that, like, there is some kind of dimension that is interacting with our own? Yeah. You know, is yeah. am I am I like a pawn in the chess game? Yeah. Do you, what, what, do you have a, like a strong theory on ghosts? Like a strong, like this is how it works? Like I do. I kind of, I kind of think it's, I have like buckets. Okay. There's five buckets that I think it could be any one oh, of these things. Okay. You know, the first is the kind of most obvious, like, yes, maybe I am interacting with, you know, the soul of a once living human and somehow their consciousness is no longer in our kind of three dimensional reality that they're in this strange energetic you know, the, the, the traditional, th you know, think of what a ghost is. You know, the second is, is, the, is it just interdimensional? Is it go, you know, we just cease to exist in a, in a, in this reality and, you know, whatever we're made of goes to another one and, and somehow that is allowed to blip over right. uh, into our space. Um, the th you know it's almost more like quantum type shit right and all times happening at once so yeah. we're all existing and at once exactly and it's you know it's that whole thing of like time and space doesn't exist so it's yeah it's just it's basically like pages in a phone book right you know everything's just touching and you know whatever um the the third is you know is it um there's some strange unknown undetected energy spectrum that when we encounter it, it elicits uh, hallucinations. So like people that live under power lines, I always, always, I always use this example, like people that live under power lines can get headaches, they can feel nauseous, they can get physical reactions to the EMF from the power, you know, power lines. And, but, uh, you know, 
for the longest time science was like no that can't happen you're just you know whatever hypochondriac but it's like no it's a real thing now and you can get you know essential emf poisoning um are we is that happening to some energy field we just don't know what it is um the the fourth is um is it essentially more toxic is it are you breathing in mold right and i mean psilocybin is a mold you, you know you hallucinate on that if long-term exposure to some kind of toxic mold in a house you fucking hallucinating from right and and haunted houses are always old shitty worn down moldy houses oh interesting yeah yeah and then the fifth, that's true you don't get ghost in like new modern co-ops yeah yeah <laughs> high rises yeah yeah, and it's exactly like a brand new, you know, shiny right. house. It's although I in my old even was house. built on the site of whatever. It's not <laughs> like yeah. And then the fifth is um, kind of more into it. It's more into the kind of quantum. It's it shares a lot with like my second kind of right. theory, where it's just, um, it's just quantum energy, and right. you know, and we're manifesting it through kind of power of thought well what about the simulation thing and this is all well that I my guess... son my eight-year-old thinks we're in a simulation he thinks we're a, he thinks he's a character being played i think that i think that is absolutely plausible you know i you you kind of i often think like i mean how many times does things happen in your life where you're like wow what are the odds of that right yeah like what are the odds of like well, like take you and I, for yeah, instance, exactly. like exactly. we have so many of the same interests. We know so many of the same people. We bump into each other every few years and we're like, oh, you're doing that thing. I'm do doing the that same thing. Things. Yeah. I think I'm looking in the mirror right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so oh God, we're, we're handsome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's uh, yeah, it's I don't know. Like this could all just be this could all just be some fucking weird thing. Yeah. That That's, we're just playing in. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you look at AI that what what's the difference between the AI saying it has feelings and emotions and us saying we have feelings and emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Are you scared about AI for, uh, you know, as far as being a writer and creating things? Uh, no, it's interesting you keep, it's funny that you ask a lot of kind of, are you scared of questions? Yeah. And like all these scared of questions are like, well, there's, if that reality happens, how do I adapt to it? Yeah. Right? Like even our biggest fear if this illness happens, how do I adapt to it? So mm -hmm. the question is, if that happens, how do I adapt to it? But again, I think it's like, you know, if I was a copyist and then the printing press in the, you know, 1500s or whatever it is, yeah. well, that put the copyist out of business, but hope they found something else great to do and got a break from the copying because someone else could do it mm. better. So, uh, no, I see it as like, I see it like, um, it's pretty wild, man. It's pretty wild. My son was trying to stump AI <clears throat> and trying to blow its circuits out by asking it these incense in these wild paradoxical <laughs> questions and it kept coming it was coming with great stuff it's why it's wild and so now i'm more scared of again i'm scared of people's reactions to ai yeah i'm scared of people trying to uh but i'm i'm lately my latest thought on ai <clears throat> is if you look i'm going back to communism again mm -hmm. but if you look that communism was created by the invention of the fact the industrial revolution and the factory and this new class of workers so i'm wondering with ai what are the political and religious paradigms that will form around it. Interesting. Um, and how much of our, will we end up in a, um, in a completely uh, algorithmic political social system. Mm. Uh, for example, they, uh, I think, again, I could be getting this wrong, but I think Google about privacy laws, they can't, I'm getting this slightly wrong, but they can't now tr say they can't track you now, but they can put you in a cohort. So what if they find that s s mo like a certain percentage of people in this cohort are committing violent acts? If you happen to be in that cohort, are they just going to arrest you ahead of time like Minority Report? Mm. So my question is, how are we going to handle this intelligence? I'm less worried about that than how that intelligence is going to handle us. Yeah. So, and also what changes in, like, I think that our children we were talking about earlier, we know when you're, even your oldest is an adult entering the real world after college in 10, 11 years, like how different is that fucking world going to be than now? Oh my god! Yeah, it's fucking just. And our kids, the last generation of like naturally born, <laughs> randomly assigned sperm and egg. Yeah, children. Yeah, you know my my. It's funny. So my fiance, she wants to you know she wants to have another kid, and she's like, I want a boy, and and I'm like, cool, but like, I don't want to do the, 
dis you know i don't want a doctor involved in it i just want to yeah. keep it i want to keep it old school yeah <laughs> You know, it's way more fun too. Right, and then certain society is going to have these quotas. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to it can it can get very dystopian very quickly because we've proven as humans we're mm -hmm. bad with these tools. Yeah, it's it's um, it's exciting though in a weird yeah. way. Like oh, I kind of so I kind of sit back and I'm once again being the chaos junkie. I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is going to be fun. Oh like, yeah. What's going to happen now? Yeah. You know, it's, it's well with the with the writer strike and and you know actor strike right now, I'm kind of enjoying the chaos of it all because it it it's kind of for so long, you know, forever Hollywood has always been the 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 king of the castle. It's always been like the tastemaker of the world. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing actually how really fragile Hollywood is just like everywhere else. Right. So 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 is so is Sam Altman or you know whoever from OpenAI <clears throat> is he Oppenheimer or like Edison? Yeah, you know, and we don't know yet. No, yeah. we really don't. Yeah, I mean, it, but it's wild because, like, I think of AI as the first tool we've created that's capable of leaving the toolbox, mm -hmm. and it's like a trip. Yeah, and it's also exciting. I really encourage anyone to just like use it, play with it. I think schools will just figure out a way how to incorporate it, like the calculator. You yeah. know, they'll just have assignments where they're like, okay, well, what was the prompt questions that you put into ChatBT to get that answer? Right. We're like that wasted time generation. Like like us writing an essay like or, or, a, or a thesis paper yeah. is like using an abacus. Like we're that generation. Yeah, now. it's like cursive. No one uses it anymore. Yeah, it's why. It's so, it's, yeah, but I agree. It's so cool what's happening. And like, I think not even the chaos, it's like getting to experience history in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. If I, I collect old books mm -hmm. and I have a book from like the 1500s and one from like the 1800s or something, wow. the 1700s. But if you look at them, you couldn't even tell the difference in technology, barely. Like maybe the, it's instead of being printed on animal skin, it's like paper or something. But you can barely tell the difference in hundreds of years. And now you compare the iPhone, first iPhone to the iPhone now or something, and mm -hmm. or the flip phone or the Blackberry to the iPhone. It's wild. Yeah. Do you know, speaking of old books, I don't want to out the person's location, but there's a guy in LA. Do you know about this old book collector in LA who's no. got this ha house in, I'll say East Los Angeles, okay. you know, a suburb of East Los Angeles. Um, and apparently someone I know met this guy and they told me the story. They go to this guy's house and it just looks like a normal, like craftsman style house in like a LA suburb. And this guy has like, one of the largest, most expensive antique book collections in the world, and it's all hidden in his house, like walls that move. And apparently, this guy's got fucking uh, pages from the Dead Sea Scrolls, Whoa. and like really like insane old wild books, and it's just his home collection. And it, like he'd say, turned his house into a museum. I don't know if I'm more excited about the books or the walls that move. I know. But well, I, I see was all of that. the whole thing when yeah. he was like, yeah, like the walls moved, and then there was like fucking dead sea scroll like on this can like, we add this to our list of things to do after this? I, I, gotta, I really want to visit that i want to go too yeah, yeah that be amazing. i i went through like a first edition collecting phase for a minute um you know back before kids and i had money to spend right yeah yeah and free time <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. like yeah well this has been fun neil it's been fun i we, know we could go on forever know, so we totally gotta yeah force ourselves to wrap up but uh yeah we got some we got some things we gotta do <laughs> yeah yeah totally we do we yeah. do we didn't even get into all the crazy stories we'll do that for another episode oh yeah i think so remote viewing and all that kind of stuff <laughs> um but awesome man it was so good catching yeah, up absolutely love chatting with you thank you hopefully uh it's interesting to other people besides ourselves for sure oh wait where can people find you uh here they can find me here no <laughs> i love when people ask that because literally like everyone knows how to find someone. It's now, true, right? Yeah. Right. But like, you're I just at Neil that. Strauss. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like literally, like <laughs> ask ChatGPT where to find me, and probably tell you exactly where I am. <laughs> well, moment. then that that's it. Ask ChatGPT. <laughs> right. And then if you can't don't find me there, make up the image on Mid Journey. Done. And wait, your podcast is? Are you still doing that? The pod, the, the true crime podcast is that? Yeah, I do like a season every couple of years because okay. it's so intense. Speaking about grit, but yeah, to live and die in LA is the missing persons okay. podcast. Super intense. All right. But also. Trying to do a good thing, hopefully. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. All right, brother. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.